found his secret Reddit account. And I am furious. On a throwaway account, because he doesn't know yet. I've been suspicious for quite a long time now, months, and have been quietly investigating on my own. I have been seeing changes in behavior, an uptick in phone usage, and have felt more distance coming from him. Every once in a while, I get the gut feeling that he was with someone that day. A few times, he has smelled different coming home, is slightly distant in behavior, almost like he doesn't want to get too close to me, and is acting a bit nervous. All this has triggered me to snoop through his phone when he leaves it around and when he is sleeping. I've come across a few apps that I have learned are frequently used by people who cheat to communicate with affair partners. I also came across his secret Reddit account and his activity on an adultery sub this weekend, and I was finally able to confirm that he is actively cheating on me. I am frustrated, and I don't know what to do. He doesn't know that I know, and it has taken everything in me to try to act normal in front of him and the kids. I have confided in one friend because I just don't know how to handle this, and I can barely stop shaking all weekend. She told me to do more investigation to see if I could find out who the affair partner is before I confronted him. I never thought I would be here, contemplating divorce, what would happen to my kids, and losing all of our life plans. What the heck? I don't deserve this. All I can think of is what a complete waste. He's ruined everything. Update, hi everyone. I first want to thank all of you for your advice and support. I'm not someone who likes to post or air my personal struggles, but in a very real moment of anxiety, panic, sadness, and a bit of wine, I made this post. And I'm so glad I did. It makes me sad to think of all of you who have gone through this type of betrayal, and at the same time, it has made me feel less alone. I spoke to an attorney today. We are in a no-fault state, so infidelity wouldn't impact a divorce, but if it came to a custody battle, the details of the infidelity might be helpful. I am grateful, the attorney has an opening tomorrow, although I don't think I'm quite ready to make any sound decisions. His next opening isn't for three weeks, and I want to do as much research as possible before I confront my husband. And I don't want to wait three weeks for the confrontation. So, tomorrow it is. The one friend I've confided in was able to get me an IT specialist who is a family member of hers. He met with me this morning, and he was able to retrieve a lot of helpful information, including the affair partner's identity. I will wait until after I meet with the attorney to decide how to handle the affair. I feel like everything is moving very fast, but at the same time, not fast enough. I know I need to gather all the information and get my ducks in a row before my husband is tipped off, but I also just want to get this confrontation over with. Thank you all again. Update 1. This morning, I met with my attorney for over two hours. Yesterday, he sent me a ton of paperwork and a list of things to bring. Basically, all of our financials. I felt prepared. Meeting with him put me a bit more at ease as far as my own financial future goes, which was a huge concern. We live in a no-fault state, which means infidelity won't have any bearing in the event of a divorce. However, if there is a custody battle, which I don't see happening, details of the affair could be useful. I asked my attorney if it would be appropriate to contact the affair partner's husband, and he gave me the green light to do so. Right after my meeting with my attorney, I called the affair partner's husband. It was a short phone call, letting him know about the relationship between our spouses and that my husband is unaware of my knowledge of the relationship, he asked to call me back. And shortly after, he texted me, asking to meet with me in person this afternoon. He assured me he would not tell his wife that I had contacted him. Well, I just left our meeting. I am sitting in the car, feeling a sense of relief, but also dread. The affair partner's husband had been suspicious for months. They live a few towns over, and we live about an hour away from a major city. My husband spends a great deal of the work week in the city, in fact, we have an apartment there, so he can avoid the long commute home during the week when meetings run late and he has work dinners. The husband says a fair partner had been spending a lot more overnights during the week than was typical in the past few months for work. She had been on her phone a lot more frequently and had become protective of her phone. He saw a flirty text over her shoulder at one point and accused her of cheating about two months ago. She had excuses, but he let them go. The majority of their meetups were at our apartment. I told him their message exchanges proved this. A few of my favorites were from her. I wonder if your wife will smell me on her sheets. I hope she does. I was sent when my husband told her of a planned weekend in the city with me and my kids. Is it wrong that I think of the apartment as our apartment, our home, just me, and you in our little love nest? I own half of an apartment, by the way. 
I gave a fair partner's husband a thumb drive of all of the evidence I had discovered, there is a lot, and a very detailed spreadsheet of every meetup, dinner, gift, hotel visit, etc. My husband would be very proud of that, he is a spreadsheet guy. A fair partner's significant other asked me to wait a few days to confront my husband to do his own investigating. I gave him the information about my new best friend forever, an IT expert, and my divorce attorney, he mentioned looking into getting one. One thing I should add is that this man is extremely good-looking and very in shape. My husband is a good-looking guy too and takes care of himself, but this guy was really something. I don't know why that surprised me. He was also very kind and sympathetic, which I was relieved about because I was wary of the response I would receive. The plan is to keep in touch so that we can confront both of them at the same time, separately, of course. Update 2. I spoke to another betrayed spouse today regarding the evidence found and the logistics of the confrontation. The other betrayed spouse had said at our meeting that he was going straight to divorce. Reviewing the evidence I provided to him and his own investigation eliminated any little doubts he had about divorce. My husband has been in the city for work since Monday, and he comes home tomorrow. The other betrayed spouse and I are both confronting our spouses tomorrow night, at the same time, but separately. A question that the other betrayed spouse had asked me was, what was the one date time that bothered me the most? He said for him it was when a fair partner said she was away in Los Angeles for work. Their son is asthmatic and had the flu while she was supposedly in Los Angeles, and he was in the ER for over 10 hours with his son. She was actually in the city with my husband, just an hour away. It obviously would have blown her cover to come home, and the other betrayed spouse said he was blown away that covering up her own lies was worth more than being there for their son. For me, I think it was when we planned a three-day trip to tour my son's top choice of colleges and explore the city of that college. This had been planned out for a few months, but a few days before the trip, my husband had a work commitment come up. In messages, I found that a fair partner also had a work commitment unexpectedly come up. My husband chose to spend those three days with a fair partner rather than spend that time having a pretty amazing experience helping our son make a choice for his future. Yes, my son got into this college and will be attending this fall. I'm a nervous wreck for tomorrow night's confrontation. Today, another betrayed spouse said, we're on the same team, we'll get through this. I hope so. Update 3. Me, do you think we have a good marriage? Yes, of course. Why are you asking this? Me, you're happy in our marriage? You think we have a good marriage? Yes, everything is great. You're scaring me, why are you asking this? Are you not happy? Right now, no, I'm not happy, I'm pretty frustrated right now. Him okay. Me, I thought we were happy too, which is why I'm trying to figure out why you're cheating on me. Him what? Why would you say that? Me, because you're cheating, how can you say that? Now I'm upset. I would never do that to you. How could you say that? You know I would never do that. Me, I know you're cheating. Silence. Head and hands. Looking at the floor. Then she jumps off the couch and storms into our bedroom, saying, I need a minute. He returns about 10 minutes later. His eyes were red, like he'd been crying. The first thing he says is, what do you know? I say, I know you've been cheating, I want you to be honest with me. He says, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. The conversation devolves into me asking for details. He goes on to say it was just a fling, it's over, she meant nothing to him, it didn't last long, he doesn't know why he did it, he's sorry, he's so sorry, there were no feelings involved. Both of us were crying, and I was crying a lot. At one point, I say, I must have done something really terrible to you for you to do this. He says, you've done nothing, it wasn't about you. What was it about? I don't understand. We have this beautiful life, there has to be a reason, and I don't want to hear that you don't know why you did this. And this is what he said, which I can't wrap my head around. Everything with us was great, it's always been great. But I started getting attention from her, and it just happened. I started thinking about the monotony of our lives, there are no highs and lows. It just felt exciting, I guess. And once it started, I wasn't able to stop, it was like the adrenaline took over. My response was, let me get this straight. You started being with someone else, sneaking around, lying, and blowing up our entire lives because we were too happy. He admitted it sounded stupid to say it out loud, but it's just how he felt. I asked who she was. 
He wouldn't answer, he said she has a husband and kids, and he didn't want to wreck that. What about our marriage, me, and our kids? It says so much that you are choosing to protect her and her family over us. He said it's not like that. At this point, I told him he had to leave, which he resisted at first, but I was literally breaking down and so upset, and I told him I couldn't be around him, so he packed up, coming to me every few minutes to check on me and say, I'm so sorry. My brother showed up as he was packing. I told him I already had a divorce attorney working on things, and that he needed to get an attorney. This shocked him. You can't just decide on your own, we are done, we have to talk about this, we can work through this, there's the kids to think about. My only response was, it seems to me you and, a fair partner's name, already decided this for us, don't worry, she's having just as terrible of a night as you are. This made my brothers laugh, and my soon-to-be ex walked out with him, and I saw them arguing out in the driveway, then he left. I spoke to the other betrayed spouse briefly last night and again this morning. This has gotten long, so I will do a short update in another update post maybe tomorrow, but as a mini update, the affair partner is at a hotel right now. Update 4. This morning, we talked with the kids. Anonymous or not, I'm not going to get too detailed about the discussion to protect my kids' privacy. I feel it's unfair to dive too deeply into their most vulnerable moments. Kids ages 14, 16, and 17, almost 18. Beforehand, I had spoken to my soon-to-be ex about this talk, telling him the information my therapist gave me on the healthiest way to approach it. I told him that he should be the one doing the talking because, well, we all know why. He did not want to have this talk, he felt like it was too soon and what if we work things out. It will just confuse them and get them upset for nothing. I then explained that they will know something is up, because he will no longer be living with us. 2. The only thing to work out going further is a co-parenting plan. He tried to engage in a discussion about us. I declined the offer and kept it about the game plan of the conversation about the kids. I sat down with the kids when they came home from my sister's house. My soon-to-be ex started the discussion using the very vague explanation the therapist suggested. We are having problems, can't find a resolution to those problems, and think it's best for dad to move out for a while so it doesn't affect the kids. There won't be a lot of difference in our home lives since dad spends much of the week in the city, and dad will be able to spend time with them on weekends. Silence, from all three kids. Oldest, you're cheating on mom, aren't you? The other two chime in, stop, he would never do that. Arguing amongst the three kids. Soon to be ex says not one thing. Nothing. I ask them to calm down so we can talk. Everything's been fine, we'd know if you've been not getting along, you're cheating aren't you? It has to be that, the soon-to-be ex is silent and won't say a thing. You have to tell them. Silence. Me to kids, yes. All three start yelling and crying. How could you do this? Why would you do this? Are you getting a divorce? There was lots of yelling and crying. I hate you. On and on and on. Soon-to-be ex, I know you're all upset, you have a right to be. I've let you down, but this has nothing to do with you, it's between me and mom. I think he might have said this as a way to let them know this isn't their fault, but it backfired, how can you say it has nothing to do with us? It has everything to do with us. My oldest called him a hypocrite, always telling us to respect women, lecturing me about how to treat my girlfriend, and you're messing around on mom. There was a lot more conversation, mostly with the kids saying things in anger and soon to be apologizing. When things calmed down, I told them that they could go to my brother's house and that I needed to talk to dad privately. All my brothers, sister, and spouses had gathered at my brother's house, knowing I was telling the kids and thinking having their cousins around afterwards might be a support for them. Before they leave, my oldest says, Mom, he's not staying here, right? Like, he's not coming back here, right? I mean, there's no coming back from this, you know that, right? Once the kids left, I told him he should pack more stuff while we were all gone. He said, don't you want to talk? I said, what else is there to say? I am traumatized by having to sit and watch these kids go through that. Now, are you thinking of the consequences? Are the lows worth it? I told him to text me when he's gone, so I know he won't be here when we get back. Update 5. Hi all, I'm sorry for my delayed update. It's been a roller coaster ride with so many emotions to deal with. Emotions of my own, my kids, and some family. My mother-in-law and father-in-law returned from vacation last week, and they are having a really hard time with it all. 
My soon-to-be ex and his siblings sat down with them to break the news, and they are devastated. My mother-in-law has called me every day to be a support system, but the conversation usually turns into her saying, I didn't raise him to be this way, and crying. My father-in-law tried to talk me into reconciliation for the kids. I know he is coming from a genuine place, as they are both very worried about the kids, so I am trying to be patient with him. He is very disappointed in my soon-to-be ex and has had to put a pause on our conversations because he is brought to tears. The kids have started therapy. They have opted for group sessions together. Their therapist has encouraged this approach, as he says it will help in their healing process to learn to be a healthy support system for each other. Reconciliation with their father will be a long process and might look differently to each of the kids. Group sessions will help each of them accept each of their individual journeys towards reconciliation with their father, so it will not damage the sibling relationship. My soon-to-be ex and I had our first proper conversation about the affair and our separation or divorce. He still wants reconciliation, I do not. Something I asked him was, if roles were reversed, would you forgive me? We both know he wouldn't. His response was, you're a better person than I am. Basically, he was expecting that if he were to get caught, I would give him a chance to reconcile, he never thought I would decide on divorce. I said, you have higher expectations for me than you do for yourself. Do you think that's fair? I have had a session with my therapist since our talk. Maybe some of you have insight on this. My therapist said what my soon-to-be ex said is very common in wayward partners. They don't think the relationship will end without being given the opportunity for reconciliation. They feel entitled to reconciliation because they spent so much time blaming their betrayed spouse to excuse their infidelity. Has anyone else experienced this? Last week, there were an array of emotions. Anger, sadness, grief, anger, anger, anger. The last few days, I felt detached. Many people have asked for updates on other betrayed spouses. I feel like he is much further along in this crazy process than I am. Probably because he had suspected his wife's infidelity for a number of years. The affair partner is staying with her sister. As far as I know, there has been no contact between her and my soon-to-be ex. Another betrayed spouse says her abusive partner is angry at my soon-to-be ex because she thought they would be together. She threw that in the other betrayed spouse's face when he confronted her, and now she has an egg on her face. I have shown the other betrayed spouse all of my posts and all of your words of support and advice. I felt it was only fair that he knew I was posting our business. I'm trying to talk him into joining Reddit if only to peruse these support subs, as I've found them so helpful. He says he's not a social media guy, but he'll think about it. Thank you all so much for your advice and support. I know I've been absent, and so many of you have commented and sent me messages to check in on me. Having these outlets available has been such a comfort for me. I can't properly express how much. Update 6 and D-Day 2 Preface, any names mentioned are not real names, they are fake names to make things less confusing. To all of the veteran betrayed spouses who warned me he'd done this before, you were right. Very early this morning, I woke up to an Instagram message sent to me in the middle of the night. From a fair partner, from a fake Instagram account, I have her blocked on all social media. Hi, it's a fair partner, just so you know, I'm not the only one. Ask him about Megan. I've got a feeling he's been lying to both of us and felt you deserve to know. How nice of a fair partner, after being involved with my husband for seven months, to suddenly think of my feelings. I screenshotted it, didn't respond, and blocked the account. Ironically, soon-to-be ex was stopping by at 9 a.m., as we had to go over financial information and our monthly budget, and he needed to find living arrangements locally. I call my sister, on the verge of a panic attack. Panicked. I just found this information, and I'm going to see him in two hours. She calms me down, and we try to brainstorm about who Meg can be. How to find out who she is. I sure as heck wasn't going to ask the affair partner. My sister calms me down somewhat and tells me to confront him and record it on my phone for evidence. Instead of this being a productive conversation about finances and future arrangements, it's D-Day 2. Soon-to-be ex comes over with coffee and bagels. How nice. We sit down in the kitchen, and I ask, so, have you spoken to a fair partner? He says he had her blocked on everything, but she was trying to contact him at work last week, and finally, on Friday, he had it out with her and told her to stop contacting him. I ask, how about Megan? He looks surprised. Huh? Megan, have you talked to her? 
He starts saying he doesn't know what I'm talking about, and I just say, you can't keep doing this to me, acting like I'm crazy. Please just tell me the truth. I'm having panic attacks and can't sleep. Just please, I know, you know, I know, I need the truth. To make a long story short, Megan is a woman from this organization he joined five years ago of professionals who get together to network, get ideas on team building strategies, growth strategies, marketing, etc. They get together six times a year in different destinations. My take has always been that it's a bunch of yuppies using business networking as an excuse to go on extravagant vacations every other month. The affair with Megan began in June 2019 and ended in April 2020. He claims it ended because he felt guilty, but I think it really ended because of the COVID shutdowns. Megan lives in a neighboring state, but works in the city. At first, he swore their hookups were only on these trips, but after some pushback from me, he admitted they met in the city a few times. He said he's had no contact at all with her in over a year, because she left the group. But wait, there's more. I asked him if there were any others, and begged him, please, don't make me find out on my own, just tell me now. I can't do any more of these confrontations. He said there was one more affair partner. Almost five years ago, a few months after we bought the apartment. He dated Cindy for three months, they had sex only a few times, and she ended it because Cindy didn't know her soon-to-be ex was married, she dumped him when she learned he was married. After I told him to leave, I called my sister. Fill her in, she asks if I'm going to tell Megan's husband. She says she better do it soon before he warns her. Look her up on IG and FB, nothing. My sister is also checking, Megan must have blocked me, because my sister found her right away. She found my husband on Instagram, I couldn't, I guess she blocked me there too. But I was able to find his work information and work email. So I sent other betrayed spouse Craig an email explaining everything, he called me within 20 minutes of the email. It turns out he caught Megan sexting another member of that group last year, which is why she left the group. They'd been in marriage counseling for a year. Craig said he knew in his gut there was more, and she gaslit him for the last year. He asked for the recording I made of the soon-to-be ex admitting the details, and we will be in touch. All of this happened before lunch. I'm shocked, angry, and hurt. I feel like I don't know this person anymore. Update 7. I am the proud mama of a high school graduate as of this past weekend. This weekend, actually, this last week, was full of lots of emotions. His prom was a few days before graduation, too. I wish I could say I went into these special moments with a positive mindset, but I failed miserably, I fear. I think this was because when you get to these huge milestones, which aren't just milestones for your kids, but also for yourself and your relationship, it also brings up memories of the past as well as all those plans or dreams for the future, and I've spent a lot of mind space questioning memories of the past as valid or real, because of soon-to-be ex-husband betrayals, as well as mourning those future plans and dreams. It's odd sharing space on what should be a momentous occasion for our kids with the person who betrayed you. It's odd sitting next to your wayward spouse at your oldest kid's graduation, knowing that without this cloud over us, we would be high-fiving each other and saying, we got one through high school, two more to go. Instead of anxiety and silence, our two other kids opted to sit next to their cousins to avoid their father. It was both of our families getting together for the first time, who normally are pretty tight and friendly, but were tense and awkward. I planned a huge barbecue for my son and lots of family and friends. Our immediate family knows the reasons for our separation, but our extended family does not. So it felt like putting on a show in a way. The week leading up to the party was filled with anxiety and racing thoughts, like movies I can't stop playing in my head about the betrayals. My oldest pulled me aside last week and told me he had been talking to his college about delaying his entrance for a year, so he can stick around home and be a support system to me, help me with things around the house and with his brother and sister. I told him absolutely not. He's worked his butt off for four years to go to this university, and he's going. It makes me so angry at my ex. I am so angry that his choices and selfishness have made my kids feel responsible for me. Worries about me. They need to pick up his slack and make up for his choices, it shouldn't be that way. My ex has finally retained a divorce attorney. He's been informed via my attorney that all contact should be made through attorneys, unless pertaining to the immediate needs of our kids, in which case communication will be made through a parenting app. Of course, my ex is not happy with this. At our son's graduation, he wanted to know why we couldn't at least be friends. My response was, my friends don't mess me over the way you did. 
He is still in contact with Megan, a fair partner too, and he continues to get together with her. He claims to have made no contact with her, I guess he thinks I'm an idiot. I don't have contact with Craig, other betrayed spouse too. I have told him he won't know what hits him if he attempts to bring that woman around my kids, and by the way, I have informed his parents exactly who he's been hanging out with. Call me vindictive if you will, but if anyone messes with my kids, even their other parent, I will go full mama bear on them. He claims he would never do that. I said, yeah, there's a lot of things I thought you'd never do, but here we are. Other betrayed spouse one is ahead of the game compared to me. He got his ex, a fair partner one, divorce papers at work. They used to work together at the same place she is currently employed. So when she got served, of course some of his old colleagues reached out to him to check in, and let's just say he didn't hold back. Apparently, this put a fair partner one into a spiral. Well, that's it for now. For a few weeks I thought I was doing well, somewhat on my way to move forward, but this last week I feel like I'm back to square one in a way, anxiety, mind racing movies, anger, tears, it all has come crashing back. How are y'all doing? Update 8. The further along I go on this new path of infidelity, the more I see my ex for who he really is. An idiot. It's such a strange experience to have the blinders removed from D-Day and see the person you've spent two decades with for who they really are. An idiot. I can come up with more colorful descriptions of him, but I'm trying really hard to be classy. My oldest son's 18th birthday was last week. He didn't want anything big, so I put together a barbecue slash pool party for close family, including his aunts, uncles, cousins, grandparents, and ex, he made plans with friends for later. My siblings refused to speak to my ex, so there was that awkwardness. It was tense. But the party ultimately was a success, as much of a success as I could have expected under the circumstances, considering my 18-year-old is not on speaking terms with his father. Let me preface example number one of why my ex is an idiot. My cousin's son and my son are the same age, I'm very close with my cousin, and the boys are very close too. My cousin and his son are super into dirt biking, my son would love to be into it too, but it's the one sport I've said no to. However, since the boys turned 13, I've allowed my cousin to take my son with his son on a yearly camping slash dirt biking trip every summer. They are actually planning to go next week. Anyhow, to get to the point where my ex is an idiot, toward the end of the party, my ex presents my son with his gift, a motorcycle. Yes, a motorcycle. Of course, he bought one for himself as well. Son, I don't know what to say. Ex, I know you like dirt biking, so I thought this would be cool. Son, this isn't a dirt bike, and I don't have a motorcycle license. X, we can get you one. Son, I am leaving the state for college in a month, what am I going to do with this? X, maybe you can bring it to school. Son, a freshman can't have cars on campus, and anyway, where would I keep them? My son might seem ungrateful here, but what happened next was that he got really quiet and just walked away. This is not like him, he's a pleaser, a very conflict avoidant. My ex was upset, asking WTF. My daughter, 16, much more combative than my son, says, he knows you're trying to bribe him, dad. And she's right, this is what my ex does, instead of doing what he needs to do to work on things, he will try to charm his way or bribe his way back into good graces with grand gestures. This time, it backfired. Example number two of why my ex is an idiot. As he is leaving the party, I remind him he should make his flight reservations for when we move my son into his dorm next month. He says, oh, I forgot to tell you, I can't go, something came up. Apparently he is working on himself, he dropped therapy because it wasn't helping him and found a life coach instead. He booked a meditation retreat across the country for that week. I am proud of myself because I didn't say a word in response. My spidey senses were peaked, and I had a gut feeling he was hiding something. He told me he was going on his own to work on himself and really focus on himself. But my gut feeling was telling me something, and I wasn't going to question him because I've been working really hard at maintaining very low contact. I called Craig, OBS2, the next day to check in. I asked him if Megan was going away next month. Surprise, surprise, she is going away on a week-long meditation retreat. My ex thinks I'm an idiot, but he's the real idiot. I don't understand how he can think he can ever rebuild a relationship with his kids if he doesn't put the work into it. If it were me, I would be doing everything I could to prove myself to my kids. I'd be showing up always, even if I had to stay in the background, to show them that no matter what, 
I will always be there, even if they're pissed at me, not speaking to me, or even if I make mistakes. I would always fight for relationships with my kids. My ex gets him a motorcycle as a quick fix when what he should be doing is showing up for major life events, even if, no, especially if it's difficult to do. It's frustrating to watch, but what I've learned in therapy is that my ex's relationship with the kids is up to him to maintain, not me. I'm only responsible for my own relationship with them. But God, it's so hard to watch. Fake Persona As some of you know, I initially learned of my soon-to-be ex's seven-month-long affair by finding his secret Reddit account, where I was shocked to find an eight-month history of engaging in pro-adultery subs. Last night, I decided to torture myself by going through all of my screenshots, he deleted his account, of the story of his life, a fake life, that is. What triggered me to do so was a post I came across on one of the support subs of a wayward partner talking about how they would go to that pro-adultery sub and make up lies or exaggerations about their significant other for the purpose of getting validation. They wanted to be cheered on in their choices to make them feel as though they were justified in cheating on their partner. And they were enabled by members of the sub to continue on. I wonder how many wayward partners do the same. Here is the story my soon-to-be ex put out there about our lives, along with my rebuttal, aka the truth. Fake soon-to-be ex dead bedroom, he had to beg for sex. We have sex three to four times a year, and my wife just goes through the motions. Truth, we had a very active and fun sexual life. I initiated very often, he has never had to beg for sex, and I can't even remember a time when we've gone more than one to two days in a row without sex. Fake soon to be ex, she's a stay-at-home mom who refuses to go back to work, so I'm trapped. Truth, when I had my oldest, I wanted to go back to work, but soon to be ex guilt tripped me and told me it made him feel good to support the family. He made more than enough to support us, and with his hours, it would be more beneficial to our overall lives for me to stay home. Through the years, he has always bragged to everyone that he loves that I take care of our personal lives because it makes his life freer and stress-free. Fake soon-to-be ex-wife never wants to do anything and has no life or interests. Truth, I have a ton of interests and hobbies, I enjoy a lot of outdoor and athletic interests, and almost all of my soon-to-be ex's hobbies and interests were introduced to him by me. He stole all my interests. We also frequently did these activities and hobbies together. Fake soon-to-be ex, he loves that his affair partner is well-traveled, she's not, and that she always initiates the planning of getaways, dates, and activities. The wife never wants to travel unless it's kid-friendly, how many times can we go to Disney? Truth be told, we traveled quite often, both with the kids and without. Always to new destinations, both domestic and international, all initiated and planned by me. And I hate Disney, and we've only gone with his family. Fake soon to be ex, he loved surprising his affair partner with little gifts like flowers or her favorite candy. He loved that she made a big deal over little dates like Valentine's Day, yes, they had a romantic V-Day together. These are things his wife never appreciates. Truthfully, my soon-to-be ex has never gotten me flowers in over 20 years of our relationship. He didn't believe in giving flowers because they were a waste of money, he also hates Valentine's Day and thinks it's a consumer scam. I've never gotten any gift from him on Valentine's Day, yet every single year I always surprise him with his favorite candy. Fake soon to be ex, he complained I started an argument about money because I was frivolously spending and I didn't like him calling me out on it. Truthfully, we did have an argument initiated by me, but it was because he had gotten a very substantial cash bonus at work and he came home with an $18,000 Rolex. We never spend our money on items like this and always discuss big purchases, in hindsight, this was a red flag. I also learned through their messages on Telegram that he purchased his affair partner a $2,000 Movado watch and very expensive earrings with this money. Any guess of what he splurged on his wife with this money? This list can go on and on and on. Has anyone else experienced their wayward partner creating a new persona or rewriting history to make you look bad?